Questions, anyone? Yes, Larry. Worst experiences. Oh, there's so many. Yeah, everyone. The year Emily and I did it, it was pouring rain. It was, it was really difficult. Uh, honestly, I wouldn't have made it through had I not. We we're, were much younger. I had spent um, a ton of money to, you know, I didn't have to get over there. And um, so there's no way I was not going to finish. But I made a, a really, you know, you get into the moment, you start making kind of stupid decisions. Um, so I got over there, and, my, and half my stuff, I put my crank and some of my parts into a separate bag. It didn't make it over there on the same plane with me. Um, I ended up buying replacement parts. The bag ended up showing up. Um, but in the sort of the, the heat of the moment, I didn't, um, my saddle was way too low. And I didn't realize it for a couple hundred miles. Um, you know, and also it was pouring rain, so I didn't drink because who needs to drink? You're, you know, I wasn't thirsty, I was wet and cold. Um, so I ended up getting horrible, horrible cramps. Those two things, like, you know, my legs were hurting in ways that I never thought possible. I mean, it was just excruciating pain. Um, but I was like, you know, I, I have to get through this, this stuff. Uh, so, um, and I finally realized that I raised my saddle, I started to drink, and I, I you know, I finished in time, uh, like, like 89 hours, 30 minutes, or something like that. Um, you know, so it's those sort of things where, you know, had my saddle been the right height, Right. From the get-go, had I been drinking the entire time, you know, I would have, I would have been completely fine. So, you know, everyone has a story like that. The reason why you do all the qualifying rides um, is, you know, hopefully you kind of work out all those kinks. So by the time you're up to the really long distance stuff, you know, you know for sure, <laughs> raise your damn saddle. <laughs> My the one addendum to that in terms of kind of the silly things that you think you would be smart enough to not make this mistake. Um, like Jake said, it was cold and raining the whole time. And, um, and you know, my bike was getting noisier and noisier and grinding more and more. And finally, I kept thinking, well, I should, I should really go ask somebody for some chain lube at one of the controls. I'll do the next one, I'll do the next one. Finally, I got around to going to the mechanics tent and asking for some chain lube, and they had this jar of this like sticky red stuff that they had like a toothbrush or a paintbrush, and they just sort of slathered it all over everything. Um, and of course, they were all very excited and had to all bring, they had to, before they could like give me my chain lube, they all had to like call over everybody else to come and look at this crazy person with the fixed gear. Um, but I got back on the road and I was like, huh, it's so much easier to pedal now. <laughs> and um, so, you know, what do you know? When you ride hundreds of miles in the pouring rain, um, it helps when you put some new chain lube on there from time to time. <laughs> and of course I knew that, but I don't know how long I was going, you know, grinding away unnecessarily until I finally went and got some chain lube and then it, like, magically got better. <laughs> More questions. What's the best thing to eat? Anything you can. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever, whatever tastes good, whatever you can get down. Everyone, every, yeah, there, there are 6,500 riders, there's probably 1,300 opinions on that. Um, 7,000 yeah. opinions yeah. on that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the trick is eat a lot, basically not stop eating, because um, a lot of people, that's their biggest problem, you know, they, they think they, they have to, they, they just forget to eat, or they think they only want to eat one particular thing. They go out there and they only want to use perpetuum, and then if their stomach starts turning south and perpetuum, and they don't kind of figure it out, um, you know. Eat so, early and eat often. Yeah, I mean, it really, it's, it's just, you have to listen to your body the entire time. And think to yourself, what what do I need right now? Because sometimes it's a slice of pizza, and sometimes it's a milkshake, and sometimes it's, you know, just something salty. Another, another way to think of it to me is, what can I possibly cram down right now? <laughs> and if it's something that you can, if you can get it to go down, then eat it. What's a reasonable amount of time to figure after the ride's done before you're ready to pack it up and come home? For, for a PVP or for, yeah. I mean, yeah. The, the, I think we pack, packed our bikes the next yeah, day. Yeah, I mean, they have these, for those, there, there was travel agents, um, one travel agent, 
that pretty much um, handles all or you know, all of American um, flights uh, and hotels and all this. You don't have to use them, but they do kind of simplify things. Um, so if you're going to take one of the flights, they recommend you know if you have to get back for a job, you don't have a whole lot of choices. Um, yeah, you're going to be off the, unless you're in great shape and you know and you're really doing several 1200 k's a year. You're probably going to be off the bike for a week or two. You know, we're only doing short recover rides. It, it took me a long time before I was back up to doing more than just commuting. I will say there was one time I did a thousand k with one other person. There were only two of us on the ride, and um, he had planned a flight home. The ride, the cutoff time was 7 a.m and he had planned a flight home for later that day, and he was supposed to coach his kids hockey that night. <laughs> what an idiot he had. Well, and I think he was, he was not expecting that we would be right up against the time limit on this ride, uh, which turned out to be a harder ride than he expected. Um, and he really regretted cutting it quite that close. Um, but I think if you, I think, you know, by the next day, you're probably at least competent to pack up your bike and do what yeah, you Yeah, I mean, do. although you know, this person, um, he's, he's an out of Kansas City region, but I recently did the math, just in rent and oaring events you know, in the US, that one rider has accumulated more than 600 days of his life on rent and oaring events, if you have all, all those finishing times. So, you know, and he's been doing this, I think he started a couple years earlier than we did, so he probably started in 2004, 2005, so, yeah. What portion of the time in the PVP were you on somebody's wheel versus <coughs> breaking the wind yourself? I, you know, and that's, it, it's, it's such a big variance. When I did it, you know, in that, in, in my full almost 90 hours, I got about um, maybe four hours of sleep. Um, but there's so many people on the ride that, you know, I think there was only one point where I didn't see someone else, you know, before, you know, closer or after. That's definitely good. Particularly now that there's 6,000 runners, particularly at night, there was never any, the whole night, that you didn't see a red light in front of you. So you can very rarely get lost because it's too And if, if you and want to draft. You pick up people as you go along. The James, was it the James? They travel in packs. The Germans. Huge groups. And the other thing is, in France, the drivers are much more patient. So you get in one of these groups of the Danes, and you just kept going. I mean, it didn't matter. The cars would get off the road, practically. So, so it depends on, um, and then as, uh, was it Harriet, you said about some of the people that you rode really fast between a couple of checkpoints, that happens too. Some of them go by you and just grab on the his or her wheel and that and I've never had so much fun. He couldn't speak English and I couldn't speak French, but we just had the best fun. And we just, I was exhausted after the gun was died when I got there, but I had, I needed to make up the time. So you really are by yourself. And you can just pick and choose when you're going to ride with other people or somebody will come up and, and hang on your wheel for a while. So um, you, they're almost, and now it's 6,000 miles. I can imagine what it's like now. I think people yeah. who are comfortable with drafting, you'll always have somebody to draft off of, and if you're not comfortable, you can ride on your own, and it's fine. So the one thing to really understand, why do you ride PVP, especially this day and age? You know, it's, you are on a ride with, you know, so many thousands of people. Every, almost every country on Earth is represented by at least a couple riders. You know, some countries have, you know, huge contingents, some just have a few, um, you know, places, you know, Philippines, where I wouldn't think there'd be a whole lot of long distance riding, they have riders out there. So, um, you know, it's an international sport that is like no other. Um, and that's what's, it's so fun riding with all these people from different cultures, but you have this connection, because uh, you've all done the same qualifying rides, you've all spent a lot of time on bikes, um, it's, it's really unifying, it's, it's an amazing experience, and nothing comes close to that I've ever done. Have you done other 1200Ks? How do they compare to the PVP? They're really different. I mean, the, the big thing is that at PVP, there's, first of all, so many people, and other 1200Ks, the last year that BMB was run, I think it had 100 and some, and other 1200Ks domestically are more like, 15 to 50 people kind of in that range and 1000 k's 
I mean, a thousand K is not very different distance wise, but they tend to be a smaller scale event. So those are more likely to be 10, 20, 30 people. Um, so that's a big, that's a big difference. I mean, a lot of other 1200 Ks or thousand Ks that um, the stops will be gas stations or just a snack full of tables. And it's completely different scale than like getting to an entire gigantic high school that's been completely taken over and the entire field is set up with just bike parking. And just to walk from where you have to park your bike to where the cafeteria is, is like a distance because the place has to be so big to support 6,000 people. Um, so that's, that's one thing that's, that's really, really makes the difference. You, you mentioned a couple of times uh, a BMB. What, why did that stop? <laughs> Jennifer Wise, who had taken over, she, she had peer stood it for I 10 years or years 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 something like that. She, um, it's a, a much more difficult ride to support because she limited the field to 75 people, even on the, and it was spread out from Boston to a suburb of Montreal with that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, Logistically, to put it on was very difficult. I mean, we a lot of us helped and volunteered. She just, I think, she decided she um, was tired of doing it. Yeah, she felt it with that. And and no one's taken it over, unfortunately. Yeah, there's a, there's another type of riding that that Arusa, um, provides called permanence, and these are similar rules to purveys, only you negotiate when you're going to do it. You can do it anytime. Um, you discuss it with the permanent owner. Um, you're usually the only person who's out there doing it that time. Um, so it's a little bit more informal, a little more ad hoc. And b, &B is a permanent, so there's been people here um, who have done it uh, just sort of on their own um, as a perm. Um, so they all have <laughs> follow up question. Who did the first b, &B? Charlie Lynn. Yeah. Charlie Lynn. Yeah. yeah. Who, I, who I believe is also the training run for PBT because the first couple of times that America, uh, well, I can't remember exactly the dates, but because um, PBT is the oldest organized bike event in, in the world. But in the early days, the Americans were not successful in doing it. So the um, people that were running PDD said the Americans had to qualify for two years. Two years. Two years before, before you were allowed to do it. So Charlie Lamb, I think that's when he started doing yeah. So he started doing BMD so people could get more experience with it. And then I, I was told that it was 75. Mm -hmm. There was a large group of Americans went over and it was really bad weather. And oh. I'm told that an enormous amount of bailed out French That's where the bell came from. But the bus chops from the Americans came I was told it was up there. No, I think it was I I was just told that Charlie said that a contingent of Americans went over and they bailed out because of the bad weather. I think we had to qualify for two years of Wow, because we didn't have to do anything. Yeah, and, and at this point, the rides are so, it's so, yeah, there's so many people who want to go. You pretty much have to do some of the rides the previous year anyway, just to be able yeah. to pre register to be able to go this year. Wow. So the only people that are able to go, you know, this year are those that have done at least a 200K. Um, and that's really they're kind of expanding the field. Uh, it was looking like you'd have to have done a 400k or so last year just to be able to. The way know. that the way that they set it up is people who have people who did a thousand k last year get to sign up first, and then people who did 600k last year get to go sign up after that, and then so there's like a um, later and later start dates when you were allowed to start signing up based on what your longest thing was last year. You still have to do the qualifiers this year. And in theory, if there are still slots left by the time you get to people who didn't do anything last year, you could start this year and go, except that it'll be full by then. Start playing for 2023. <laughs> <laughs>